Um, so this is session two, um, and I start off by introducing Tim Setchfield, who's going to take us through the project accounting update. Hello, everyone. Um, hope you had a good coffee. Uh, this is um, the bit of the day for those people who know that accounting is interesting and fun, uh, as well as understanding that it's uh, essential. Um, yeah, and it's great to see so many old friends and hopefully some uh, future friends. Uh, I'd like to know how many were here for the very first user group. There can't be that many. 13 years ago, a few. Okay. Okay, um, time is against us as, as ever, and some of the things which we're showing today are a bit complicated. So uh, we, it is going to be a very fast run through. Um, and uh, uh, we do have other sessions in, in the day for you to clarify some of the things that we're, we're showing. Um, so let's just crack on. Uh, I thought I'd just start off by showing you, the, d doing the demonstration. So I'm going to show you um, the, the things that we've been working on in project accounting uh, this year. And a massive chunk or, or a sizable chunk of what we've been doing has been to modernize and improve our resource planning tools, tools that were written um, by, uh, uh, by one of our younger programmers some uh, seven or eight years ago. Uh, we've completely rewritten those tools and added some much needed features. I'm going to start off looking at a project. It's a new project. It, it's only just been created, really. It's got three known people on the team so far. And if I look at the accounting tab, just scroll down a little bit, the project's got a bit of budget and uh, information entered. I've done some fee entry, and I've done some invoice planning. Uh, Actually, with a wry smile on my face, and maybe a little bit of embarrassment, we have got rid of the double negative. So it now says that things are open instead of saying that they're not closed. Um, so we, that's the, probably possibly the most important thing we've done this year. Um, the new resource planner contains quite a lot of additional um, features. But what I'm going to do is start off by using it in a manner that uh, makes it similar to the way that it currently works. So I'm going to use it for one work stage and in its most basic form. So same icon. So far we have nobody on the project, so it's the very beginning of the process. Um, and I'm going to, uh, the screen looks different, doesn't it? It looks quite different. Um, but lots of the features that you've seen in the resource planner are here. We've still got weeks across the top. We've still got this drop down here, which is controlling the amount of resource that we're painting into the grid. Um, and, and I'm going to build up and look at some of these features uh, now, uh, gradually. Um, so first of all, I'm going to add some contacts. We've made this screen more rich as well, but we've also kept some of the simpler functionality that it currently has. So um, just like now, it's easy to add everybody um, f who, who's work working on the project that's not on the resource planner. And uh, I'm going to add a placeholder as well. Um, so if you've used our resource planning tool, this should be fairly familiar. We've got a, a single tab listing all the internal people on the project and a tab listing all the placeholders. I'll come back to this a little bit later if there's time. So we now have uh, four people on the project and a date range in which to plan. Um, we've changed the way that we think about the units that we're painting. So previously, when I selected an entry in this list, it was a percentage of that person's working week. We've made a subtle, but it is an important change, such that it's now um, a percentage of a standard week. So we can work out how many hours each of these entries means. And I'm just going to show you. We've got the same ways of putting resource on that, that you've, you've currently got. So I can click and I can drag. If I hit the right cells, I can drag. Um, I can change to 100%. Um, yep. uh, and etc. cetera. Uh, so, so far, that's quite similar to the, uh, the way that the 
um, current resource planner works, you'll notice immediately that we've changed the way that we display the level of allocation. Previously, it was all about how dark the colour in the cell was. And instead of that now, we've got a bar that's drawing to fill up the, the, the space, the width of a week. And what that allows us to do is to use the rest of the space to indicate more information. Um, this is where we, uh, we see some of the additional features. So we have three options here to indicate uh, in the bars the part of the week that's unavailable because of my working time, to show the amount of resource that I'm, spent el that I'm spending elsewhere on other projects, and to show um, bookings from the absence system. So that immediately does a few things. First of all, we've got more complicated display in some of these cells. And we've also got display in the blank cells. So previously in the uh, current resource planner, a blank cell, you don't know any information about that blank cell. Can I, can I allocate anyone for that week or not? I don't know, I've got to try first. So I've got to waste a click in order to find out more information. Now we can see that information at a glance. Um, if I'm under allocated, obviously the bar will have a bit of white space. So uh, here we have uh, quite a little white space there for Steph in that week. Um, if I'm over allocated, I'll have no, no white space. And in this case, we've got half the week being, oh, that's a place that's a little less, less uh, important. So uh, John is uh, part of the week um, on this project, part of the week elsewhere, that's the light red, and then part of it on holiday in the sun, that's why it's yellow. Um, if you want a bit more information, then you can turn on the tooltips. Um, and they do make the screen quite busy and all this jumping around of information can get in the way, so that's why we've, we've, we've been able to just turn it off, uh, or we've made the ability to turn it off quickly so that you can um, get on with creating a resource plan if, if you need to. Um, so we don't have that much time. Um, and I'm going to be going over it a little bit more this afternoon. The screen is capable of showing a lot more information, but by default, when it lands in your business, it will be the user preferences will be set such that you're left um, with something that is closer to what you have currently. Okay. I'm just going to save that. So what's happened now is on that first stage, we've got some future hours that's now replacing the budget. That's why it doesn't have a little uh, information symbol against it. Um, uh, so that was the uh, resource planning against a, a work stage. What we've got now is the ability to look at the resource plan for the whole project. So what's going to happen is I'm going to click an icon. It's going to show all the work stages and all the variations for this project in a longer list and allow me to use uh, the screen that works in the same way. So now we have work stages and then people grouped underneath work stages and um, we can paint our resource in, in exactly the same way. Um, we've got the uh, ability for you to spin the grouping round so you can show contacts and then um, stages or back to that, that method. Um, we have, if I just save, you have to save the plan before you can select resource, select more people. We've extended the functionality for finding people. Um, so as well as having all the internal people on the project who aren't on the plan, we've got every internal person. So you can just click there, get a list of everyone in the business who, who, uh, who's available, uh, who, who um, is internal, uh, and you can select them and add them to the plan quickly. There's no need for us to be adding the contact to the project in order for us to be able to select them. Uh, that's what's happening here. Uh, and we've also got a search screen. So if you want to, you could say, well, I want to look at all the architects uh, or engineers in the, in the practice. Oops, I clicked the wrong thing, sorry. That's because I've got problems with Oh, there you go, there's the search. Hmm. Uh, so that then searches for all of the people in the grade of architect, engineer. And what I can do is I can sort by their availability. 
And that availability is the amount of hours they've got available in their working week pattern in the window of time that you're looking at in the, in the resource plan. So you can start to see who's got most availability. If you want to get rid of the placeholders, which you probably do, you can just say internal only. Okay, so a richer method of selecting contacts and finding contacts uh, with various different fields. And what we're doing is we're going the other way around with this tool uh, than we are currently. We don't require you to add a contact to the project first. Um, you can select somebody who's not been involved so far, and what will happen is they'll automatically be added to the contact list on the project. Obviously, we don't know what role they're in yet. That's for you to determine later on. Um, another thing that we've done, something that was really quite heavily requested by some people, um, I'm sure, who are here, was the ability for you to see the effect of the resource plan as you work with it. So we've added a, a feature here. Um, just have to make it a little bit more visible. <coughs> so what this is doing is showing you a, a subset of some of the information on the workstage band, and this all gets updated in real time as you paint the resource in. And what you should, should be able to see is as I um, do some resource planning against stage C, you should see things happen here as the um, cost rises uh, and the hours rise. Uh, let's see. Okay. Goes a little bit over, that's amber. Goes a lot over, it goes red. And if you keep going, then the, um, the, the cost will do the same as amber and then goes red. Okay. Right. So um, that's about all I've got to show on the resource planner. We do have a new global resource plan screen, which I'll show in a bit more detail later on. We do have the ability to look at the resource plan from a contact uh, point of view. So you can go to a contact, see the plan, edit the plan from the contact record. Um, very quickly, some of the additional features which we've got. We've got a snapshotting facility. So what this involves is the ability for you to take a picture of the project's current position from a financial point of view and then use that and compare, say, the current um, situation with maybe a baseline. Different project. Go to the accounting tab. We've got a snapshot. There's one I took earlier. To add a, a snapshot, it's very simple. We've got different types of snapshot. This is your own list to be defined uh, as you wish. Uh, and then if we... This snapshot surfaces in a couple of places. Firstly, it's visible in the graph, and it's also visible in some of the web queries that we've done. So here I can, that's the graph of the current position on the project, and the dotted lines say what the baseline looked like. So this project's got a bit more cost um, than expected, and it's been going on a little bit, a little bit longer. Very unrealistic, I'm sure. Um, I don't have... I wanted to show a bit of web query um, very, very quickly. Web query is the, um, the, the, the way that we can push data into, into Excel such that Excel solutions, which report off that data, can then refresh themselves. Um, and they are in use, quite wide use, and I'd be interested to talk to you later and find out um, who's using them and, and how successfully they're, they're being used. Um, we've never had the ability to deploy um, standard ones until now. And so what will happen after this release is you'll get uh, a menu function that looks like this that contains a number of standard um, data feeds uh, and you'll be able to say, oh, I quite like to do a report. And that report actually contains three refreshable data sources. Um, and once you've done this, now that that spreadsheet is, is independent of the system. It will refresh itself. Um, and uh, so this is all refreshable. You can control the, the, the project, uh, the date ranges, and that sort of thing. And it allows you to build some quite clever reports, um, reports that can look just as good uh, as a yellow fin report. Um, but they are, well, I know, weak in the sense that they're not very easy to deploy. Not so many people can consume Excel reports. So they definitely run. Um, uh, alongside, but aren't as deployable as the as the Elephant reports. So this report um, brings data from lots of different places, 
Uh, and Excel is very good at printing. So if you did need to create any printable output, then this is, uh, this is good for that. Um, that's it for my demo. Uh, so just to reiterate, this is a change. That's what the current screen looks like. The darker the green, the more the allocation. Um, I didn't like it because it meant that when you were clicking, uh, it depended on where you were clicking as, as to what that click meant. Um, so I felt it should be the same number of hours that you were um, allocating no matter where you were clicking. Um, a cell looks like that. Yep. And if it's over allocated, it looks like that. And if it's over allocated, it's important what order we, we write them in. So we, we start off with the here and then the unavailable and then the absent and then the elsewhere. But obviously the numbers two, three, four may not have any space left for them if it's 100% allocated here. Uh, lots more things that we've done. Um, any particular highlights? Copying the plans might be interesting. The, the possibility for you to create boilerplate plans against placeholders and then copy them into your, into your project as, as a starting point. Um, you can delete the whole plan, start again. Other things I think I've shown you. Um, the ability to filter and factor by probability so that you can have speculative work that doesn't pollute the resource plan um, uh, in the system. Um, so you could have 0% probability, uh, kind of completely a uh, bit of R&D, thinking about something. It doesn't really affect the plan, uh, the plans elsewhere. Other things we've done, so I don't know what percentage it is actually, but maybe half the year we spent on resource planner, a uh, big chunk of what was left we spent on absence. We spent loads of time making everything faster. The bands are all faster. Um, more detail of that later, but you shouldn't need to know how that works. It just does work and it's much faster. We're doing some uh, standard web queries um, and obviously the double negative is very important. This year what we're focusing on is the fact that some of our screens are using very old technology and we need to <coughs> modernise them uh, and uh, there will be some improving at the same time. The, the modernising means that they become more usable, they become more consistent and more supportable for us. Um, some of the older pages, so timesheets is really, really old, uh, timesheet and expenses. Even the places where we're doing some fee forecasting and uh, non-labour cost forecasting, pretty out of date. And same for that fee grid page. All are going to get a bit of a refresh this year. Um, and uh, it'll be a case of starting at the top of, of a priority list and working as, as far through that list as we can. And that's the order I'm currently um, thinking of attacking them in. Right, so... Um, I'm going to hand over to Pete in a second, who's going to do a demonstration of how the mobile timesheet and expenses works, the, the uh, features that are coming out in this release, in the 2015 release. Um, just a few things. Uh, they work offline. Um, then you can't submit your timesheet, so you can enter all your time, but then you do have to go back to the desktop to submit it. That's because we wanted to apply all the rules at that point and not some of the rules on the, on, the, uh, on, on the application. We've got iOS now, so you can use it with iPhones now, but Android coming very soon. Um, and lots of the mobile technology that we have, we have done um, is, is promoted to uh, and designed to be customized and, and tailored. This is a fixed application, so it's, it's been put onto the App Store site differently. Um, in future, hopefully, um, we're going to be doing some photographs of expenses, uh, expense receipt, uh, and some other things. And Pete's going to do a demo of that in a second. But just to remind you, you could come to my breakout session this afternoon and find out some more. Thank you, Tim. OK, we're once again a little bit short of time, so I'm not going to take too long on this. Um, this time I've chosen an iPhone uh, as rather than my iPad. It would have been just as happy on my iPad. Um, but the reason I've chosen the iPhone is really because of my experience of having used this now for a month or so, because it's made me fill my timesheets in a very different way. Um, so here's the app. Um, it's very simple. Um, so you can see I'm a little bit behind on my demonstration system here. I'm still at the 23rd of March. And I've got some time in for some days, but let's say I wanted to put some time in for Thursday. Um, I can add time simply by clicking on this little add time option here. And it remembers things I've added, added time against recently. So you can see that I've already added some CAD drawing agreed scope work against Houston Square. So I can select that and I can pop in 
three hours and save. And that's it. I mean, I could have put some notes in against it, but I've now got that on my device. Um, and what I'm discovering is because my phone tends to sit on my desk next to my laptop and my laptop's doing other things, I often pick this up and just pop a couple of hours in as I'm working. So one, one thing I think we're going to get from this, or you're going to get from this, is because people will capture it much closer to when they actually use the time, it will actually be a lot more accurate. Because I don't know about you, but if I go back and look at my timesheet for the week on a Friday afternoon, I'm struggling to remember precisely what I did on Monday morning. With this, I fill it in on Monday morning. I fill it in as I go. Um, it's quite clever in terms of syncing. So even though this device is online, if it was offline, it's the same. So if I add a time item, it's not in my list. I can click on more. It tells me the sort of things I've got that I can add time against projects. And it will sync in projects automatically that it thinks you're going to be related to. You've booked time to, you fav have a favourite project or you have as one of your existing projects if, if they're live and on your project directory. So all those, oops, all those things there uh, work in the background for you. When you've entered time into the system, um, all you will do is going back to the main screen, you'll see that um, there's a little um, area in amber saying it's not synced. And if I click on that, I can just force it to sync straight away. Now that will sync naturally in the background anyway, but I'm just forcing a sync. And what that means is if I go on to my um, Union Square system just here and I look at that week there you'll see that I now when my timesheet loads I now have those three hours for Euston Square on Thursday that have just come straight over from the device and the same is true of, of expenses if you're putting expenses in again they get synced into the expenses tab automatically um, so it's really as simple as that. Um, there's not much to it. Um, it's capturing data. It's not submitting timesheets. Um, but I, I'm, I'm hoping that as you get your hands on this, you'll, you'll agree with me. It is a, it is a sort of quite a different way of, of completing timesheets. It almost becomes the primary em entry for timesheet data rather than the web interface, in my view. Okay, so enough of that. Um, it's now time to hand over to Phil to talk a little bit about BIM. Good morning, everybody. Or afternoon as it is now. Right, um, what I'm going to do is just talk you through where we've got to uh, with our building information modelling um, solutions. Um, so, first thing is really, I'm sure you're all aware and very eagerly working towards the fact that uh, the government has uh, dictated that in 11 months' time, every government project over a certain value is going to, uh, is going to be using level 2 BIM. What I think you probably all don't know is exactly what that means um, and I think the industry as a whole is still trying to struggle with what that means. That's a wonderful diagram that every BIM presentation has to have in it so I'll just skip past that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does it mean? Um, what it seems to mean when you read, ignore all the hype and all the acronyms and all that rubbish is that it's about working together better. It's about collaborative working. It is about the model. It's about having 3D models, but that's actually almost incidental to the real requirements. Um, being able to exchange information digitally between all the different design parties. And of course, level two is, um, is that you've got several models all on the project rather than one whole model that's level three. That's probably never going to happen, at least not on the sort of projects that most people work on, uh, maybe sometime in the future. But the idea is that you've got a number of models, but the models aren't the thing. The thing is the information. It's the I in BIM that really matters um, and this collaboration idea. Um, so shared format, class detection, all that good stuff, I'm sure you've heard loads um, about. Um, so what we've noticed, looking at what everybody's doing, and all the, there's a whole plethora of different solutions that people are um, coming up with. We've got the MBS, we've got Unicode, oh, it just goes on and on and on. Um, but what we've noticed is that it's not just to do with 3D modeling. And there's plenty of software out there that does 3D modeling. You've got Revit and a whole load of other stuff. And of course, Autodesk are going to try and rule the world. Um, but there's nothing new here. Actually, the information, the IM BIM, is the same information as you've been providing 
forever. It, 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 maybe the method of delivery is different, and maybe the timing of delivery might be different, but it's still the same information. Um, level two is about collaboration. It's about reducing problems. This whole idea of clash detection, of, of resolving problems before you get to site, is very much there. Um, and the fact that it's electronically, digitally controlled rather than old-fashioned paper. Um, what we have noticed is that a large amount of this information isn't the model. It, it's other stuff. It's processes. It, it, it's 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 uh, you know it's commenting. It's it's specification. It's uh, O and M manual data. Perhaps it's a whole load of stuff. Um, and the model isn't the place to put all of that. It's just not um, it's not right. And if you do put it in the model, then what do you end up with? You end up with huge models that then have to be distributed and sent around, and that doesn't work. So what we're looking at is keeping the model small. So we want to be able to store just the minimum geometric information in the model and everything else somewhere else. Um, specifications, O&M, as I say, maybe also processes, things like RFIs, be able to raise those in relationship to elements in a model. So I know, select an air handling unit and, and ask a question about it. How do we distribute the models? Again, it doesn't matter. The point is that everyone needs to have an up-to-date version of it. Um, we've got distribute by download in Union Square. We've got the extranet, which, uh, as Pete told you this morning, is, is there or thereabouts and will be available this year. Um, but then you've got the... I guess, traditional methods like Dropbox, but they have problems because they're not auditable. You don't have the full sort of um, audit trail for those. So what we've looked at is providing a solution. At the moment, we're looking at plugins for Revit and Navisworks and also for a standalone 3D viewer that we would be able to uh, distribute or you would be able to distribute to the people within your design team uh, that you're collaborating with. And just to give you an idea, what we're looking at doing is storing all of this other information, the non-geometric information, in a central server um, that will be available from wherever. So in, 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 the, in the short term, that's your own Union Square server, potentially, um, that you have external access to. And then the plugins, the add-ins for, as I say, Navisworks and Revit and for our standalone viewer, um, will tie into that data, relating it back to the elements in the model to which it pertains, and, uh, and allow you to interact with it. I did tell it to duplicate the display, but it seems to ignore me. So basically what we have here is a Revit model. Um, and you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen is our add-in. And what that is effectively is a web interface, but it sits within the application. And what we can do is we can click around the model and we can select different elements in that model. Um, so if I select the roof, for instance, you'll see the uh, display should change. And that's now giving me information pertaining to that. And at the moment, I can add documents, I can add comments to do with that. Um, I can add markup, so I could... Um, Click on the markup tool here. This non-duplication thing's really annoying me. Ah, that's because that's appeared over here now. Right, so um, I can add markup to this, and I can save that as a comment against that document. So let me just quickly do that. Um, I won't bother adding the actual markup because we're very short on time, but I'll just add this as a comment. Um, it's prompting me over here for a, for a bit of text. So I'm just going to type that in and close that. Where's my mouse? Um, and you'll see that comment has now appeared next to that, uh, that particular roof element. Um, and that's now accessible to anyone who has a copy of this model because the identifiers within the model tie it together, um, and also who has our, uh, our, our add-in here. And in fact, if I just switch onto the Navisworks application, again, same problem. 
but I can select the roof in here. I just need to click on element. And you see that comment that I've just added is now showing up against it now in Navisworks. But that could equally be in Navisworks in a different office in a different part of the world. Um, so there'll be a lot more uh, detail on that this afternoon. So that's really the end of my presentation. So back over to Pete. Thank you, Phil. I think he's not switched it back up the top. Hello. <laughs> Excuse me. You switch it back. <laughs> right. Okay, we're on the home stretch now, everyone. I know we're running a little bit late. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about futures. Um, and really what I want to focus on here is a 2016 release and tell you really what that's all about. Um, and it's about one major thing, which is that, cross-browser support. Um, why are we doing this? Just in case I need to explain that, well, uh, there's quite a lot of demand for other browser usage with Union Square. People prefer Chrome to IE. Um, people like to use tablets, this sort of thing. These have reasonable sized screens. They could potentially look at the whole Union Square <coughs> site on a device like that. Um, people want to use Macs. Um, Safari is on a Mac, um, so we need to support that as well. I have got a comment here about the Outlook add-in, which won't run on a Mac, by the way, so you would still need some emulation software for something like that. Um, there are situations where you might want to host another piece of web software within the Union Square interface, so another zone that looks at something else, another band that looks at something else, and there's a chance those won't work if they're using more modern browser modes than we are, and they simply won't render in Union Square, so that's a problem for us. Um, and underlying all of this is just a desire to keep up with the trend. Um, and, and future proofs our software. Microsoft's focus on in terms of browser technology is moving away from Internet Explorer to something they're currently calling Spartan. Um, we need to protect our position in the marketplace, obviously, so that's a real driver here. There are some other benefits associated with us doing this work, um, which is that, and I think Tim alluded to this earlier, it gives us an opportunity to make the system more consistent. We have different, different um, periods of, of, of Union Square across the system, if you like, um, so it's going to get the consistency together. We're going to work on screen layouts to improve them. We're going to look at some things that we think are too technical, too, too complex, uh, the advanced search being a good example, and rework those fairly materially to simplify them. We have this idea of skinning, so you can colorize the system very easily without getting into sort of technical messing around with CSS. We have this notion of language replacement, so you can replace a phrase with your own version of that phrase, and it just happened across the system without any work we get more visibility of that. Um, it gives us an opportunity to look at our feature request database, which is quite a large database, by area, and look for the regularly requested things that are fairly light touch. We have a certain amount of time available here. And this is really how it's going to pan out. Um, you'd be glad to know it's not just started today. So I think I may have mentioned this at technical user conferences in the past. We have been working on a control architecture, in other words, a way of breaking up our screens into a series of segments <laughs> For some time, we have a control set built up. We already have a cross-browser version of that control set, which we built um, last year. Um, so that work's done. That's in the bank, so to speak. Um, we've also done quite a bit of work on migrating pages. And I think I showed you a few of those last year as well. So we've developed those <coughs> older pages, redeveloped them using our new controls. The next thing we build is a new cross-browser site. So there'll be a separate URL. It might eventually replace your current URL. Um, but this will be a new website on your web server. It will use the latest Microsoft web technology. We're taking advantage of that, which lets us do some useful stuff. But we're making sure that the system on IE will fail back to the older pages. So if you go to a new site and you come across a page that's not been converted, it won't not render, it will fail over and use the one that's in the current site. We're starting off with the zones. That's a fairly obvious first place to start. We'll then be working through core bands and dash parts. And we'll then be looking at our advanced search screen and making that work. And we think that um, by the 2016 release, we're going to have quite a lot of work done that will make a cross-browser version of this system, I think as I said on this, on this slide here, not complete but broad. And, it, uh, and there are a couple of other things. We're going to have to look at working files because that uses some IE technology that won't be available in other browsers. Um, the scope for reworking is fairly limited. We've got a lot of, lot of code to get through, but we are looking to make... Um, significant changes in certain key areas. 
There's some limitations to be aware of. It doesn't mean that any custom pages that you've built or we've built for you will necessarily be automatically cross-browser. And we will require modern, modern browsers. So a very old version of Chrome also won't work. So we're looking at modern versions of Chrome, modern versions of Safari, and modern versions of IE, and things like Spartan, or whatever that, that becomes in the end. So a bit of a race through that, but I'm very conscious of time. We're already running a little bit late. We have a bit of time for Q&A, and then it's off to lunch. So I think we've got some mics. If someone would like to come and grab those. Um, on the um, mobile timesheet entries, will you be able to go around, if you, you haven't done your timesheet since March, for example, yes. um, will you be able to put in time for today? Yes, you will. I could. So you can put in time for any day, yes. irrespective, but you can only go back and submit the timesheets when you get Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's good, thank you. Fit, won't you? Oh, yeah. um, that's all very good stuff. Um, just one question. We're in 2015. Um, lots of people use things like tablets, and we've looked at the mobile stuff, mm -hmm. Chromebooks, things like that. Only 7% of the world uses Internet Explorer. Are we moving towards other browsers still, or is that not on the horizon yet, or where are we up to with that? Uh, well... Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, we are, I mean, the, the development plan for next year is primarily about moving to support other browsers. Um, so that is the main focus. I mean, there'll be some rework of screens as well, but the, the primary thing we're doing is supporting devices like that, supporting Chrome, supporting Safari on Mac. Um, you know, we have done some work on that already, but th that's, the, that's the main job for next year. Any plans for uh, clustering, clustering the website and the SQL database for resilience, perhaps across sites? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Clustering, clustering of the web, the, the website and the uh, the database for resilience across, perhaps uh, WAN links or on site. Um, I think you could you can already have load balance web servers with Union Square anyway, and I think and there's no reason why you can't cluster SQL. I don't believe. Um, anyone more technical want to pick that one up? No reason. No, no reason. It's a it's a, it is expensive. Yeah, that's a very good point. Today, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, I think you have to have en uh, enterprise editions of, of SQL Server, and that's that's not cheap. Hello. Hi. Um, got a question about mobile publish. Yes. Are you ever going to plan to make it so the users don't have to intervene with Outlook to make mobile publish work? Uh, right, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Can when you, you publish an email yes. from your mobile, yep. the user has to put a folder inside their Outlook. Um, well, the folder is automatically, it will be synced from Outlook, so providing you've gone into the, the process I had some screenshots but of you, earlier. You have to create it manually. Um, you have to create the folder in Outlook manually and yes. then say what the rules of it are. We have too many jobs for the directors who will be doing mobile publish mm -hmm. for them to create those folders. Okay. It's a little bit limited because we can't actually directly change the, the email software on the mobile devices. We could write our own version of a mail client and say, don't use the Apple one or don't use the Android one, use ours. But I think that's an undertaking that would probably not be that popular, especially with Apple. People want to use the Apple email. So we're limited to what we can do. And about the only thing we can do, and the same with, the same with other vendors in our place is they use drop folders as their mechanism. It's not compulsory like, like we can make it work in Outlook because we have much more control in Outlook. In the mobile environment, all we can do is give you folders. So if people don't want to interact with them... That, that kind we, of makes it unusable for us. Okay. Also, um, emails don't have a details field when you're publishing them. Are there plans for that? Uh, a detail field in terms of... Uh, when you publish a document, you can add extra details about it. Okay. When you publish an email, you can't. Okay. Um, I don't think... I mean, that would be a change to the add-in, I guess. We'd have to Not think about that. This is a... Well, it could be the add-in, yes. I yeah, don't know. it would be the add-in. Yeah. Um, are there, there are no plans. It so doesn't mean to say we can't do... That certainly is achievable um, because we are in our own screen when we're publishing from Outlook. We wouldn't be able to do that on mobile. Though. No, We'd no. We'd have no, no capability there. Um, oh, well, going back to mobile publish, couldn't you build your own, own little mobile publish app 
Uh, we could do that. We had a go at that. But I don't think people will really tolerate moving between... Uh, they want to deal with their email and deal with it w once and for all. The idea of going into one tool to read your email and going into another tool to do the publishing, mm. I, I sort of don't think it flies. I think it's actually worse than the drop folders idea. Mm. But that's just my opinion. Hi. Um, <clears throat> on a non-technical uh, question, um, you showed something earlier which seemed to me to be a Windows uh, system that mirrored uh, the DMS, so you yeah. could you could drop folders in uh, files in sorry into it, um, and it needed a separate server. Yes. Yeah. Um, is is that something? Because you didn't say when you were rolling that out. You said, well, um, um, if the, you did, the, I missed it. Yeah. The, the code for it has already been built, and it's in the code is actually in the 2015 release but we're throttling back certain of these brand, the things we're using brand new technology, especially when we bought in technology. We're just throttling the initial rollback a bit just to understand what the sort of support implications of that are what you've been used by a wider community are. But the, the code for it is effectively done and in the 2015 release. So what will happen is if you have an upgrade 2015, it's on your system, but we won't enable it straight away. And more importantly, is it more costly or is it in the... It's part of the standard application. The standard, right. Great, yeah. thank you. Hello. Um, on the resourcing, uh, is there, as a small practice, all of our staff end up doing a bit of admin, um, a bit of marketing, and various bits and pieces. But as far as we're aware, there's no way currently to forecast or allocate those that time within somebody's resource plan. So we tend to make projects, which we were encouraged against doing, so we can allocate time against those. Is there any plan for that? Is there any way that we should be doing that differently? Okay, I think I'm going to hand that one over to Tim over there. Have the microphone back, Tim. Microphone, Tim. Microphone, Tim. <laughs> um, you could use a, a demo project for that if that's what you wanted to do, but we do have a new feature which enables you to limit the utilisation percentage of a person. So if a person spends... 50% um, of their time on work winning um, work that you don't want to resource plan, then you can indicate that they only utilised 50% uh, of their time. Uh, then you don't have to specifically plan them on anything. It just means that they get a grey bar that's halfway through that bar. That was just um, the way which we saw doing that. Okay. Um, on working files, when you're working between your desktop and your laptop, um, obviously the working files location is stored lo locally on your desktop, so when you access it on your laptop, you don't have access to the same working files. Is there any way of having the working files stored on some um, remotely accessible location or on the same database as the rest of the Union Square system, so you always have the same files? You could have you the, you could have the um, and providing you're on the network, you can have the working files directory on the network, so that whether you're on your laptop or your desktop, you're looking at the, the same area, but it means if you're disconnected from the network and, and working files on the network, you effectively don't see it unless you sort of sync that data down. Um, so that's the sort of downside with that. Just on the, the mobile publishing uh, of, of emails, uh, some of our users, what they do is, you know when you click the um, Outlook add-in and you click the sort of ent uh, the job record where yeah. the email's going to, that creates some sort of a long, quite long email address. You can kind of see it just for a split second when yeah. you assign an email to a job. Yeah. Some of our guys have been uh, adding that email as a contact in, out yeah. in their sort of Outlook contacts, so when they're out and about, they can BCC in that contact, yeah. and that's how they're getting around. Is, yeah. that, is, that, is, that a, is that something that should be considered? The problem with that is it's, it's a little bit more restrictive in terms of dealing with, you know, the, the thing about the, uh, the drop folders is I think they're just a little bit more visible, and um, you can actually program a drop folder to have multi-dimension, so you could be publishing to, if you had uh, a drop folder that represented a pool, a project, and a particular you know, and a particular organisation you're dealing with, you can capture all those things through the, the drop folders. So that the drop folder 
published rules can be quite sophisticated, whereas the, 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 what you're talking about, the sort of published, direct publish address is a little bit simpler. They can't really do as much. But it's, it's a perfectly valid way of working. Hi. Yeah. Are there any plans to develop uh, accounting software for contractors? Um, there are no um, sort of short or medium term plans for that, for that area, I'm afraid, no. no. It's a shame. It's coming that way. Is it on? <laughs> Not quite sure how to put this so it makes sense, but when we first got involved with Union Square and the workspace as it was then, mm -hmm. um, there was a great deal of encouragement for it to do our own internal branding, which we've done. Okay. Um, recent modules, particularly the Outlook add-in, mm -hmm. I've noticed force upon us Union Square published to Union Square, saved to yeah. Union Square, whatever. Yeah. Are we to throw away our internal... Bra we can't have two, it's too confusing. Tell yeah. us which one we ought to do. Um, I think you can stick with your branding. We need, there's some more work that needs to be done in the out in other areas to support, support nomenclature changes. Um, we're already, so, already aware of that. There is, underlying all of the add-in, th those descriptions are actually stored locally in files on the machine, but actually maintaining those is a sort of separate job we need some tools to deal with but it's not it's certainly not something i would say don't brand your system necessarily have you got any idea how long that will take uh, we'd like I, to roll out the outlook add-in yeah but there's some places where we have to explain to people that oh where it used to be this you've now got to look for union it, square it, it's not going to be in the short or medium term i don't think we've got so much on with our big project next year that to do a lot of work in the add-in would be it's probably um, maybe unlikely. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no add-in for us then. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm quite excited by the new report writer that uh, you demonstrated. Uh, it's something I've been looking for for, for quite a while. Okay. Um, what I was wondering was, once I've designed a report, uh, will other users have be able to set their own specific filters on that? So when it opens for them, their own specific filters, or will it always open in the method I've designed it? Um, it I mean, you can put filters into the report, True. but in terms of the, of the opening position, of the filters are defined by the report designer at the moment. Now, the, the tool we've used does allow user-based filtering to be passed in, but we've not yet um, sort of got into sort of deploying that in our integration <laughs> Uh, to that application. It's, it, it's there potentially, but in the initial release it will, it will right, be. But you see that as a potential. Yes. Because uh, clearly one wants to design something not just for oneself, yeah. but uh, for others to use and, and have that flexibility. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, a couple of years ago, we, uh, I caught wind of potential for... Uh, yeah, sorry, it's a... Uh, uh, Something we've not spoken about today, but RFI's potential for a, a rewrite, re, rewrite of uh, or redesign of RFI's. Yeah, that's, that's been done. That's effectively part of the contract administration module. Excellent. Uh, Excellent. So that's, that's okay. available. Uh, I would like to have the same functionality that you've got in the mobile <coughs> mobile apps that you're developing in the in the in the sort of IE browser. Yeah. Uh, we've done some of that work already. So, for example, the snagging app you'll see this afternoon um, in Nick's session, um, we've got a browser version of the snagging entry screen, which has pretty much exactly the same data. It's laid out differently to suit a different screen, screen real estate, but it's the same basic process. Okay. Given the um, workflow, um, system is not tied to a specific browser. Are we able to publish workflow apps for other browsers for specific tasks? Uh, yes, it's where you get to them. You know, if, if you can... If we had a separate site, for example, which was our any browser version of yeah. a page, um, yeah. would that be a viable uh, it's, development it's, method I mean, until cross-browsers are available? Yeah, that's effectively what the, in, the extranet application is, really. So when you go to the extranet, it's a different URL to main Union Square, and you are in cross-browser world straight away. Um, it, it's it's the, the, the screens that we build in the workflow UI are naturally cross-browser supporting, but it's, it's how you get to them 
you know, how, you, how you log on to a system and get them that, are, that we have to deal with. And that's effectively what the extranet gives you. Just a question there about the uh, mobile site pack. Um, the locations uh, where you log your snagging, you, you go through the, the exact location of where you want to snag. Yeah. And when you go through observations, you go to a drawing of the floor plan or something like that and pin. Yeah. <coughs> Is there any plan to sort of associate the locations with the actual drawings so that they, to the way, they're unrelated at the moment. Yeah, yeah. There are. So, in fact, we did do so. I've done a little bit of work on this already. The idea mm. is that in the snagging app, if you if you've actually selected a particular location, that we should have enough data we believe to actually limit the amount of drawings that are available for markup to the ones that are valid for that story. I suppose typically. I mean, the ideal thing would be that you'd actually be able to say, at this set location, I have X number of observations, X number of snags and obviously in future development certificates yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And you just pick a location and you can actually then hopefully filter down by type and organization. Is, is, that, is that the overall goal for the, for the app? We haven't, I mean, we haven't put as much data on, uh, on the location as, as that, but we could do. We could, I mean, currently the observation is anchored at project level, but could be anchored at location level as well. We just thought mm. it was a bit more generalized, so we wanted to start it off there. But in terms of... In terms of having more data about the location um, and then drilling into um, snags or observations for the location, that's already, I mean, the snags is already there, so you mm. can already do that. And in fact, we have some screens that actually, uh, so for example, reinspections, the reinspection listing on the device is actually orientated by location because we're imagining someone will go to a location and do a load of reinspections and then move on to another location. The problem is, because they're unrelated, you have to go to one section to look at your observations, another section for your snagging. There's no one stop to give you an overall view of where, where you're at. Yeah. But I mean, if, is there a plan maybe even in the, the snagging element, if, if you actually link a drawing and hard code in the locations to that floor plan by dropping your pin, it would pre-fill in those locations for you. So mm, that, that's not... That's I, know, not I know it's not the way you were doing it at the moment, but I mean, if you gave an option, Decide locations to select drawings, open yeah. up a drawing, set a pin, and that would maybe bring you to the end sort of uh, uh, sort of location. Yeah. Uh, so where you fill in the details, take your picture, and save. Yeah. I that, mean, it would I mean, then give you sort of a, a link of where the actual is through through an actual drawing, make it much easier for someone on site to just open up the drawing, set a pin, yeah. and then enter in the details. Is is that workflow? not on the drawing board at all? Not really, no, because the, the QR code for locations was, we, I mean, and not, we're not the only people to have done this, we think that's a slightly slicker way because there's not very much preparation, if, especially if you've got things like the IFC model of all the store, with, a, with stories and, and room and spaces in, then you can build up your location data without really having to key anything in, and then you can generate your QR codes and just distribute them around a plot. If, if you do the... Um, the, the, the thing that you've seen on some of the applications where you, where you can put a pin in an area and it knows the location, then you have to basically go into all the drawings and deal with drawing polygons and, and defining locations before that those drawings are actually able to do that sort of job. One of the things that we're looking at, though, is not so much where you put the pin in to set the location, but actually as an output to say, can we print a report that shows you what trade or what so just just so in terms of the observations you'd move that into locations we right? can move that into location yeah, yeah.